Hi guys, it's Amy Gable Stitcher here with a different type of video. This is not a stitching update. This is a kit up with me video. Um, I have not done a ton of stitching over the last two and a half weeks. I have very little to show. However, um, like all good cross stitchers, I have a new start planned. Today is March 12th, 2020. On March 15th, this Sunday, Ellen Chester and I are starting a stitch along and we will be stitching together the Botany Bay Sampler by Fox and Rabbit Designs. And um, we would love anybody who would like to join us. Um, how this came about is that Ellen and I have chatted on and off on Instagram over probably about the last year. I took a class that Ellen had taught in this October, and while we were there, um, we had a great time. We felt like we've known each other forever, and we talked about doing a stitch along together. So Ellen stitches a lot of samplers. She is a designer of samplers. She is the designer behind With My Needle, and she is... Um, Oh, Ellen, I forget your, your tag. I think it's Needleworker Ellen on Instagram. I will link it below. She is not a floss tuber yet, but she is active watcher and she is very active on Instagram. And she has gorgeous samplers that she um, has stitched. So she had mentioned that she was stitching, planning to do the Botany Bay sampler this year, 2020. This was a market release in 2019, and I had loved it since I had seen it, and we decided to do it together. So this is an Australian sampler. It is reproduced from an original, and it, I had purchased it from Kitten Stitcher, and she does still have, she does have them in stock. Um, Fox and Rabbit Designs is the designer behind the Linen and Threads Mystery Stitch Along that I think this is the fourth or fifth year um, of the Stitch, stitch Along. Um, I will also link that below. That is a free online Stitch Along and this year it is a Quaker. But um, Fox and Rabbit did do this reproduction sampler last year. I'm going to hold it up close so you can see it. And this is a really pretty sampler. So I love American samplers. I have really gotten to appreciate British and um, Scottish samplers and you know European samplers, but I am so intrigued by this because it is an Australian sampler. And I have yet to see many or stitch an Australian sampler. We are living in a really great needlework time, well, cross-stitch time, where samplers are hot and there are so many great designs to choose from. And I love this one because of all the different motifs on it. Um, this, we could say, is a, I, I'm pretty sure, my Australian viewers can correct me, but I believe it's a colonial sampler for Australia. So it does have some parallels to American colonial samplers, but it also has some parallels to British samplers. So really pretty, very excited to start this. So the first thing I do when I am kitting up a sampler so it's gonna, uh, this video is going to be me kind of walking you through what I do to kit up a sampler. And I have not chosen my fabric yet. So I'm also going to play with the fabric and the floss to try to decide which fabrics to use. But this is my process to go to kit up a sampler or a big project. Any, you know, there's so many different methods. Do what makes you comfortable, what you, what you enjoy, what works for you. But this is what I do and what works for me. So I figured I would share it. So this is a gorgeous chart. It is very well drawn out. It's very easy to read, very detailed. Um, so I am very happy with the chart. The first thing I do when I'm kidding up a chart is I look to see what materials it calls for and what the stitch count is. So this is a big sampler. 
it is 286 wide by 323 high. So that's huge. And that makes me happy because I love big samplers. I need a designer or somebody who does like the cross stitch mugs or bags or needle minders to make me one that says, I love big baps, I cannot lie. Because as much as I love to finish things, I don't get a ton of finishes because I do love baps. So um, if you don't know what a bap is, it stands for a big blank project. So um, this is a big girl and it calls for a lot of over dyed threads. So when I was reading about the sampler, it said that they did stitch the model in the over dies, but I look at that list and I say, nope, I'm not buying the over dies. They give a DMC conversion. I am gonna start with that, and if I need to, I'll substitute out, but I'm not buying 20 some odd over dyed flosses. Um, when I first started stitching, I would buy everything that it called for because I was not comfortable substituting out and that's fine. And sometimes I still do that because I really like the way the model looks. In this case, I just feel like that so many, I don't have a lot of them um, in my stash. So what I figured I would do is I am going to start with the DMC and if while I'm stitching, I don't like the DMC, I will look and try to substitute with something that is close. So that's how I tend to do substitutions. Um, and it works for me because I'll just able to do it a little bit on the fly. So I'm gonna show you, this has a nice, um, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I'm not gonna show the whole thing. Nice little history of the sampler. And this sampler doesn't so much have specialty stitches as the sampler has some satin stitched areas and um, a little bit of free stitching. So it does give, I'm just gonna show this very quickly, detailed pictures. So those are two moths on, it gives some detailed pictures of the areas of the specialty stitching. And like I said, the, the chart is very, very clear. So I'm very happy with that. So I've looked at my chart. I know I'm gonna need a big piece of fabric. I know I am going to need the floss. And I said, I'm gonna use the DMC. I typically will use my master set of DMC. Sometimes I will make duplicates, bobbins of something that is used quite a bit and throw it in the project bag. For this sampler, because I'm gonna be stitching it for a long time, I decided to give it its own set of DMC. So I made myself some thread drops, which I have never done before. I tend to be a bobbinator, but I made myself some thread drops. So they are not Nicole Needlework pretty or Nell Little Housecraft pretty, but they will work. I just use scrapbook paper and um, punch that I got at Michael's. Julie, Kansas City Girl in the Colorado World gave me that suggestion and um, that worked well. So I pre-cut my floss. I tend to stitch on high count fabric. I like to stitch with one strand of floss. So I cut my floss relatively small, short. So I cut them about 20 inches. So that's the length of my, my floss. Um, you know, that's the nice thing about thread drops. You can count, you can cut it in what length works for you. Some people like to use a longer piece. Some people like to use a shorter piece. I like to use a shorter piece, 20 inches, 20 to 24 is about the length that I like. I also, if you're stitching with two strands, if you make it long and you take off only one strand, then you can double it up and use it that way with a loop method. So, but once that would be a reason to have them nice and long, but I use one strand, we kept it short. So what I did on the back is I wrote the number, 
And then I also wrote the symbol that is used on the chart. So this is a DMC 3045. Let's see if we can find it. It was a dot. Here we go. DMC 3045. So that will save me time. Okay. So first thing I did was did the floss. Second thing I did, or actually I organ, I just, I got the floss. The next thing I will do is I will figure out what count fabric I want to do this on. There are two things that I think about when I am starting a new project. One, I do most of my own framing. So I like to try to fit it into a standard size frame, if possible. So there's different ways you can do that. Um, Lynette from Homesteading on the home front is really good at altering the sampler that she stitches to um, make it fit into her frame. I do that on occasion. This one, I want to stitch the entire sampler. So I wanted to see if I could make the, the, fab, the thread count work where it would fit in a standard size frame. The second thing I wanna do is I wanna to try to fit it onto a fat quarter of fabric if possible. Because unless you have a shop that custom cuts, which I do not have one that's close to me, you typically will buy fabric in a quarter, an eighth, or a half yard. Most of my fabric is in fat quarters or fat halves. So if possible, I would like to fit it into a fat quarter. So that being in mind, I did some math. So here's my stitch count. And then I looked through my fabric drawer and I have 36, 38, 40, and 46 count fabric. I'm not a huge fan of 36 because for me, I find I don't always like the coverage with one thread. However, I do not like stitching on it with two threads, but we put it there just, just to see. So then I did some math. There are calculators to do this online. I do it just with my calculator and my head on a piece of paper. So stitching on 36 count, is the equivalent of stitching on 18 count Ada because you're stitching over two strands of floss. So 36 divided by two is 18. So what you do is you take the stitch count, so it's 286 stitches wide, divided by 18, and I get 15.9. Do the same thing for the length, 323 divided by 18, and my number is 17.95. So it's roughly 16 by 18. <clears throat> That's the stitch size. Now you need some margin. The kind of standard rule of thumb is to add three inches in every dimension. So top, sides, and bottom. So because we calculated side to side, would be to add six inches because you're adding three stitches, three. So it would be six, the same, six from top to bottom. Um, I don't follow that rule. <laughs> because I do my own framing mostly and because I am a little bit of a thrifty miser when it comes to fabric, I do at most, I'll do four inches. So give myself two on each side. I'm comfortable with one and a half. I get a little nervous when I get down to one. So we shoot for two on each side, which means to add four inches of fabric. So I added four to both those numbers and I got 19.9, so which is like 20 by 21.95. So 20 by 22. A fat quarter is 18 by 22. So that is not gonna fit on that fabric. Um, and I don't have anything bigger than a fat quarter for 36 count. So, you know, I mean, add what you feel comfortable here. You know, some people will really, really cut it close. Like I said, I get nervous if I'm below an inch and a half. Some people will go less than that. Some people like more than three just because 
they feel more comfortable with the extra fabric or they stitch it on a frame that takes up a lot of fabric like some of the scroll rods will use a lot of fabric so do what makes you comfortable but just do not forget to add in that number because otherwise you're gonna have um, not enough fabric so all right, so I went through 38 counts, not a common count of fabric, um, but I do have a few cuts of it. And um, I have mostly 40 and 46 count. So when I did the rest of the numbers and I looked and like, you know, a standard size frame, 16 by 20 is a pretty standard frame. I actually have one that might work for this project when done. So I looked to see what, what would, um, what would fit in it? You know, like what, what, which of these would look best? So if I use 38 count, it's going to give me less than an inch or about an inch on each side um, of the frame, side to side, and an inch and a half top to bottom. That works, but I'm going to go with the 40 count because the 40 count is going to give me, you know, a good inch and a little bit side to side which is what I like. I don't use a mat, but that's about what I like. I don't like to frame right up to the stitching. And 16.15, say 16.2 top to bottom, it's gonna give me about two inches. So I think 40 count is gonna be my count here, be a, a good, good count. And it will, see this is where, see 18.3 to 20.15, I'm gonna use that fat quarter if I have it because I'm comfortable taking a little bit off the side. It's gonna give me, you know, just under two inches on each side and I'm good with that. Do what your comfort level is. So that's the math I do. I usually, you know, write it down on a piece of paper, make it on a note on my phone, do something, but that's how I go about trying to figure out which fabric I wanna use. So then I pull my fabric. I have a lot of fabric, guys. So I pulled all my neutral 40 counts out. And this is not, like, I didn't pull out white and I didn't pull out antique white. And then I get my floss. And I start to see what fabrics we want to go with. Now, I really thought this was the piece I was going to use, but this is a 46 count. Color's pretty good, pretty close. It's a little bit darker than what it's showing. I really like that fabric. This is a piece of fabric from Nancy Turner at Victorian Mono. Her fabrics are really, really nice. There's Weigart based. I prefer his Weigart and um, they have a really nice feel. And I thought when I was putting these on the drops, I thought about this piece of fabric and I said, I think this will work well, but I'm not gonna do 46 count, so off that one goes. So then I just start playing, okay? So this is another piece of Nancy's fabric. This is a 40 count, okay? This is a really pretty, like, kind of a taupey color with some little bit of modeling in it, not a lot. It's looking a little, it's a little bit more, a little warmer tone than what it's showing. And then I put my colors on top. Like I said, I am no Nicole here, guys. And see where we stand. And I feel like this is a little bit too light for me because I worry about some of these light colors. blending in. And something you can do too, if you're really not sure, if you take one strand, because I'm stitching with one strand, if you're stitching with two strands, take two strands. If you take one strand and put it on the fabric, that will give you a better idea of what it's gonna look like. That's too close. Can you see that? Or not see it? It's very, very close. So take that one strand, or if you're stitching with two strands, put it on the fabric, colors you're wondering about, and 
that will give you a better idea than just the whole floss toss, just the one strand. Yeah, I feel like this is too light. Okay, so this one's out of the contention. All right, so let's go next one. This is a Zweigart fabric. This is Country Mocha. In every other count but 40, it is called Vintage Country Mocha. I have no idea why they dropped the vintage when it hits 40, but this is a printed fabric, okay? So the back of it has no modeling. The front of it is modeled. This is less expensive if you're looking to buy fabric that I hand dyed, okay, um, which is nice. It's not uh, super expensive, but it does have some interest in it. And I really do like stitching on this. This to me is gonna be a contender, okay? Because when I pull the browns, the tone is different enough that I feel like it's not gonna blend in. Oops, where's my strand? I can still see that. And let's pull one of the lighter colors and see how it looks on it. And I'm not really, actually there's one bright color I'm worried about, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I'm not worried about the brighter colors. I can see that too. Let's pull a green. And this is why I use bobbins, because I'm always afraid I'm gonna end up with a tangled mess, but we're gonna give it a try, because it is the hip thing to do right now. That green's nice too. Okay, so we're gonna put this one aside because that one's a good contender. Okay, next, this I think is actually a fat third. This is sand. It's not as yellow as what it's showing. Let me get some white behind this to maybe help. So, but, I already know, like, it's not going to do anything for these colors. I think it's it's too, it's too yellow. It has too many yellow tones. And to me, this piece of fabric would look better if it did not have, it will be really good for a sampler that does not have all these colors in it. Very pretty piece of fabric, but I don't think it's going to work with these colors. Next, I'm not going to use this one. This is a Victorian motto piece of fabric. I had actually given, I had two pieces of this. I gave one piece to Julie, Kansas City Girl, Colorado World, and she's using it for her familiar sampler. And this to me screams Halloween. It has that really nice dark and gray modeling. So I wanna use this for a, something that has a lot of, you know, grays and blues. Um, not these colors. So I'm going to put that aside. Okay. Another Victorian motto fabric. This is a really nice piece of fabric. It's a little bit darker than what it's showing. It has some nice modeling on it. Not opposed to doing something on pink, but I don't, feel I think a sampler would be really cool on this but I feel that some of these colors the orange that red that green just do not work on this fabric so I can see probably this actually I could see a few blackbirds looking really nice on this fabric See, so you pull it back here. Definitely, you can see more of the, the pinky tones to it. Okay. All right. These two are no-goes, too. We'll just go through these really fast. These are seraphim fabrics. Okay. Um, this one's a little bit too mottled and a little bit too dark. For me, I kind of wanted a dark piece of fabric for this, but once again... I feel like it just the, does not work for the colors. This is called Dragon Dust. 
and this one's called butternut and i love this piece of fabric this is very close to like um christmas in williamsburg and the sea fabrics and i thought about using this but i feel like some of these browns i feel like there's too many browns in it they're just too close like this one right here let's pull one of these it's just it's it's too close so some of these colors are gonna get lost all right so now we are on, yeah, we're, we're not done yet. <clears throat> Told you guys, I have a lot of fabric. This is a contender. I really like this. This is one of Silk Weaver's dyes um, colors. This is called Sandcastle. Okay. Um, I did this when I went to, pick this up when I went to Needlework as Delight. It's a very, um, it's getting a little washed out once again, but it has some nice modeling on it. Um, it's a light tan with some modeling, some interest, but I feel like it's too light for these colors. I don't think they're gonna pop on here. Let's take the ones that I'm concerned about. It's one. Yeah, I don't feel like that fabric, especially the lighter ones, doesn't doesn't do anything for it. Okay. <clears throat> Another Zweigart. Um, this is one of their standard colors, platinum. This is a contender because it, it doesn't have the white modeling in it. It's kind of like a silvery color, but I'm pretty sure that I am going to stitch Savior's Praise on this piece. And once again, I do think a couple of these are going to blend in. So, all right. So these are the last two that I'm pretty sure we're going to go with and with me with the Country Mocha. Picture this plus Ren. Okay. This is... A nice fabric this is easy to get picture this plus or you know one two three it is a nice neutral with a little bit of modeling interest on it in it Ren is one of those fabrics that um it's not super dark it kind of has some of the same tones as the country mocha but it has more white in it um Sometimes some of the pieces of Ren can be very light. Some of the pieces of Ren can be very dark. This one's more of a darker one. And then the last one is a Newcastle from Silk Weaver's Quaker Cream. And this is kind of, once again, it's in that same line, right? So it has some little bit of modeling to it. Not a lot. And this is showing very, very, I'm going to fill with my light for a little bit. It's really blowing these out. Let me see if I can get it a little bit closer. If you bear with me. Maybe not. Ah, that's better. Okay, so this is close, okay? So let's pull the three pieces. These are the three pieces that I think I'm... Um, between here. So Country Mocha, Ren, and Quaker Cream. And I can tell you too, so when I was looking through these and pulling out, there's one color here that I was like, oh my God, 
this pink. And I looked through the chart. I'm like, well, maybe it's only used in like the faces of the people. No, it's actually like around the entire alphabet of the sampler. So, um, like there's actually quite a bit of it. So I can tell you right now before I continue, I'm gonna sub it out. Probably one of these three fibers. I just went into my fancy floss, which is mostly Victorian motto, separated by color, and I pulled three pinks that I thought would look good. Which one am I gonna use? I'm not entirely sure because I will need to wait until I stitch it. But just looking at it with the other two colors, like this one's close. This is how I go about substituting a floss. So I'll say, well, this one's close in color, right? Which is why I chose it. But I really like this color because I think this one goes very well with the other colors in there. And this one I pulled because it's very pale. I don't think it's gonna, I won't use that for one of the pinks. So let's pull these two out too. So that's kind of how I go about substituting. So when I put this in my project bag, I'll throw these two in. When I decide which one I am going to use, I will probably put the other one back in my fancy floss. And my fancy floss is just, I keep them in these snap wares. And I just separate them by color. Like it's, you know, it's not, I don't have an alphabetized system or anything like that. So let's look at these three. All right, let's look at them one at a time. Let's look at these two first. Now, I think either one of these could work very well. Very well. Let's look, I mean, both of these pinks work very well. Let's pull a couple of these neutral colors. One more. Okay. And if I pick a fabric that I love and one of these fibers is blending in, like that's fine. I'll just substitute it out. Or maybe it'll be still look okay on the, you know, fabric when it's surrounded by something. You just don't know. So a lot of this is just best guess. So let's look at this one first. Those don't blend in. There's some nice contrast. Let's look at the run. And I don't think it's showing up in the camera, but the run is definitely a cooler fabric than this one here, which I forget the name of. This is why I never really use my fabric, Quaker Cream. Yeah, so I love Ren. I don't think I'm gonna like it for this project. I love the modeling in it, but it doesn't work with the colors. So now I am between Quaker Cream and Country Mocha. And I don't know. I don't know which one I'm gonna go with. I think I'm likely 
going to go with the Quaker cream. Because I'm looking at it now, I like the interest on the Country Mocha as far as the, you know, the fabric. However, I think because the modeling on this one is much subtler, I'm going to go with the Quaker cream. And both those pinks work on it too. Actually, that one right here. Oh, that's gorgeous. Now I want to do a Quaker <laughs> on this fabric with pink foxglove because I think that'd be pretty. So that's my plan. So what I'm going to do is I will, my plan is to do this on Silk Weaver's Newcastle Quaker Cream. This, I believe, is a fat half. I do not have a serger. What I will probably do is keep the piece intact until I stitch the border. Then I'll cut the fabric and borrow my friend's serger to serge the edges. So going into a project bag will be my fabric. My my non Nicole Needleworks floss. I may end up using bags. <laughs> my one that I know I'm gonna substitute. One or two of them substitute. And um my sampler, the pattern. I do one of two things also with my pattern. Okay. I typically make myself a working copy. What I mean by a working copy is that it is okay to make a copy of the needlework if it is only for your personal use. So I will typically make a broken copy. I generally only do one page at a time, maybe two, fold it up and put it in the bag. The rest of the pages I put in page protectors and I keep in a binder near where I sit, sit and stitch. And I pull them out and I work from that because I do not typically mark up my charts. Um, but sometimes I take things and go with it you know, on the go. So I do like to keep the page I'm working on in my bag, my project bag. Um, but the chart does stay at home and it will be in page protectors in my binder. Once I am done with that page that I made the working copy of, it is destroyed and I will make a copy of the next page. Um, as I said, it is okay to make a working copy of what you're working on as long as it's for your own private use. And if it is a non-PDF PDF chart like this one is, and I decide to pass it on, I need to make sure my working copies are destroyed. So um, I tend not to pass many of my charts on. Um, I do like to keep them, but when I do pass the chart on, all my working copies are gone. So that is just a little bonus um, copyright <laughs> information. So, so that is my plan. I will be starting this on Sunday. Um, we actually had all of our activities canceled on Saturday because of, if you haven't heard, there's a coronavirus, um, COVID-19 pandemic. And um, yes, I live in the state where Biogen um, happened, where there are many cases. So we are having lots of activities and closures and stuff. So I might start this early and this might be my um, COVID-19 sampler. So maybe it'll get done sooner than what I thought. But that's the process I go through. Um, I tend to do that for most big projects. It's something I enjoy. Like I enjoy doing the math to figure out what fabric it's gonna work on, think about how I'm gonna frame it, um, pulling the floss. It's thinking about the fabrics, like what, what do I wanna use it on? What do I want the background to look on, look like? 
that to me is something I enjoy. And I enjoy doing this. I enjoy kidding it up so that when I am going to work on it on Sunday, it is all ready to go. All I need to do is thread my needle and go. And I will often even just mark on my fabric with a pin where I am going to start and put that first stitch. I typically am a corner starter, so I will mark my fabric two inches down and two inches across, put a pin in, go over a couple of threads to make sure that I didn't count poorly, and then I will work. I tend to work left to right and then top to down. Do what works for you. A lot of people, especially if you're cutting it close in the fabric, you know, if you're playing chicken and you only have an inch or an inch and a half, start in the center because that way you know that you're going to have equal fabric on each side. So do what works for you. Um, I hope this video was somewhat interesting um, and maybe helpful. Um, I'm really, in I'd love to see how other people kit up their projects. So um, if you're a floss tuber and you kit up, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing videos. Um, let me know what you think. And we would love to have you join us with this stitch along. Um, Botany Bay Sal, S-A-L, um, hashtag, you can follow that on Instagram. I'll be showing updates here. I will likely do a regular floss tube update video next week. And um, this is gonna be a sale going on for a little while while Ellen Chester is able to knock out a huge reproduction sampler in a few months. Um, yeah, I can't. <laughs> so um, feel free to join in and, um, you know, now, a few months, um, whenever, because I'd love to see everybody's project. So have a great one, guys. Thanks for watching and um, happy stitching. Bye.